Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. It's a real privilege for me to have back on our show today, Dr. William Parham. Bill is the director of the National Basketball Players Association's Mental Health and Wellness Program. And on our show today with him, we have two wellness program advocates and former NBA superstars, Derek Anderson and Tracy Murray. Bill is the inaugural director of the Mental Health and Wellness Program, a position he's held since May 2018. He focuses on working with athletes across organizations, across various athletic levels, and across sports. In addition to his involvement in the MBPA, Bill is a professor in the counseling program at Loyola Marymount University, where he focuses his teaching on a variety of courses, including trauma counseling and multicultural counseling. Derek was selected 13th overall in the 1997 NBA draft. Derek played for the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Clippers, the Spurs, the Trailblazers, the Houston Rockets, Miami Heat, and the Charlotte Bobcats. He appeared in over 20 playoff games, including an NBA championship title for the Miami Heat in 2006. Since his retirement in 2008, Derek has used his platform to support the next generation of athletes through public speaking, his work with the Rookie Transition Program, and in 2015, he created the Stamina Foundation with aims to empower youth and young adults with resources and life skills. Tracy was selected 18th overall in the 1992 NBA draft and played for the Portland Trailblazers, the Rockets, the Raptors, the Wizards, the Denver Nuggets, and the Los Angeles Lakers. During his professional career, Tracy appeared in seven playoff games, including the NBA championship title with the Houston Rockets in 1995. Since his retirement in 2007, Tracy has been an advocate for mental health and athletics and shares his story with incoming rookies and free agents every summer in the NBA's player development program. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Hey, Bill, if I could start with you today and welcome back, share with us about this program, the NBPA's program, its primary goal, and what you hope for most happening through this program. Well, thanks again, Graham, and good morning to your audience. Glad to be back here and certainly share the mic with two good friends and, and celebrity athletes, as you'll see. Phenomenal hoopers, but more importantly, phenomenal men. Again, I've been in this role since 2018, but what I think is real important is that the Players Association, which is different than the NBA as an organization, Players Association is the voice of the players. Mm. It started out in 1954 where players are basically saying, we're willing to hoop, but we have to have some different perks, some accommodations for us. And fast forward to 2022, it's a, an organization that continues to listen to the voice of the players and advocate on behalf of the players, not just for compensation, but also supporting many of their causes, and chief of which are social justice and, and really working with youth. So this program really has expanded quite considerably. We have a number of services for players. Well, we've also gone in partnership with a lot of the media who really have helped us get the message across that a player's mental health is their mental wealth. Yes. And we really are looking to lead the conversation in terms of redefining what mental health and mental illness is. Mm -hmm. That we've abandoned the old notions of mental illness based on traditional notions of psychology and medicine, which are rooted in models of pathology and disease, and there's something wrong with you. What we've adopted actually is looking at mental health on a continuum. Yes. One to ten. Folks on the eight to 10 range are doing pretty well across domains in their life, their sport, their relationships, businesses, et cetera. And they have a sense of agency. I can do this. They also have a good sense of anticipatory skills, understanding challenges and not backing down from challenges, but embracing not the challenge, but the fact that they have skills to meet. Mm -hmm. Then we have players on the four to seven range who for the most part are doing pretty well. But there is an area in their life, maybe two, that they struggle a little bit more with. Maybe it's finances or relationships. Not enough to derail them, but enough to redirect some of their energy. And then we have folks on their one to three range mm -hmm. who are really struggling pretty mildly. And the idea there is to really be pretty aggressive and assertive with interventions. Now, all across the continuum, the last point I'll make, 
it's not about solely obtaining good mental health and wellness. It's about maintaining. Yeah. So even for the folks up to the eight to 10 range, you know, they may be solid right now, but five, 10 years from now, life happens, the circumstances will change. And so we want to prepare them to be able to maintain where they're at. And likewise with the uh, guys or people generally on the other uh, two points of the continuum, we want them to also maintain. And so we're all about teaching, educating, developing tools for players to use. Mm -hmm. And thus far, it seems to be working. Yeah, I really like that continuum versus either or, the dichotomy that oftentimes we do. Either you are or you're not, or you meet a diagnostic criteria for or you don't. What you're talking about here with that continuum is you're making a commitment to an investment in that athlete's life over the course of their career, but also probably just to go over the course of their life in general to make sure that they get to maintain and be at their peak performance, whether it be you know, on the court or as a father or as a husband or whatever role they may be in. That's absolutely correct, Brian. In fact, the, the word that you use, invest, mm -hmm. we have used, again, the analogy of their mental health is their mental yes. wealth. If your head isn't right, you're going to feel compromised in the other area. Yeah. And I think what you'll see in talking with both D.A. and Tracy, they're remarkable in what they have overcome and challenges and to distinguish themselves as they have. Yeah. It is just phenomenal. And that's where you really see yeah. the gems of their survival genius. Yeah, it's I, I, absolutely I, incredible. Yeah, that survival genius. I want to highlight that. That's something that I know. It's something you've termed that I really like that. Maybe I could use it as a segue, Tracy, Derek. I would love for our listeners to hear from you both about what you've experienced in your life and your career that brought your attention to the importance of identifying and managing one's mental health. I guess I'll start first. I started with Dr. Parham when I was at UCLA. I was a freshman at UCLA. So uh, Doc and I have a history, a long history. I had a lot of pressure on me being a McDonald's All-American coming into UCLA with all of these expectations of bringing a national championship. We had a really good team there. When you wear those four letters and DA can, can contest this with Kentucky, when you're a blue blood team and, and you got all these expectations, then comes the pressure, then comes the outside criticism, you know, also affects you. You've got to be a student athlete, student first yes. at UCLA. Right. I mean, it's it's just really a, a tough balance for a 17 year old kid coming in as a, as a freshman. Also being let off the leash, making your own decisions. A lot of them are going to be bad because you're finally out there doing your own thing. So Doc came in, I, I had a serious issue with concentrating. Mm -hmm. I had a serious issue with falling asleep in class. I wasn't used to the workload. Mm -hmm. I, I was stressing out because of the workload mm -hmm. and, and doc was able to kind of balance me out. It was a long time ago, doc. I don't remember the exercises, but it, it was, it was a while ago where I, I was, you know, we worked together a lot. And back then the, you know, the stigma on me was, I was mad. might've been a little nuts, you know, but that, that wasn't the case. It was just, mm -hmm. I needed help balancing myself out. And I think Doc did an excellent job of doing that. It's interesting. You know, I think very few people appreciate all the things that happen at one time at 17, 18 years old, coming in at that level from the schoolwork, the pressures, you know, the, 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 the letters on your Jersey that hold so much tradition and legacy that people are looking for you to step up and kind of just continue that. And these are things that we don't, you know, oftentimes get trained for, or we don't learn how to, to address and, and lean into. And it's not that you're born with these things or you're not born with these things. These are things that we can learn, but we very rarely understand that, one, what the pressures are when we first come in. Secondly, that there are some real techniques and some ways to strategize in order to, you know, increase the chances of being successful and, and, and letting our potential really kind of begin to kind of show and come out. Derek, how about you? Well, Tracy was right. The Kentucky, the pressure is always about winning. It wasn't yeah. about anything else. The only good thing that I had built for me was basketball was my savior yeah. because I had stresses from home life. I didn't see both of my parents from when I was 12 until I was 35 and 36 years old. So they lived in the same city and I literally lived on my own, sleeping in other places, sleeping in gyms, stay with a high school coach. I had two jobs at age 15, 16. I had, I was a single dad for 17 months with my son while his mom was arrested for shoplifting. So I had a whole different perspective on life. 
I was more about survival gene, as Dr. Parham said, was my survival was about life. So when I played basketball, it was like that was the threshold for me to release. Yeah. I got to go out there and play hard. I didn't care about anything else. This is what I poured my life into. So when I heard criticism about, hey, you guys are supposed to win by this, I was like, man, that's that's nothing. I, <laughs> I've been sleeping in empty apartments for, for years. So like to me, I was battling the survival mode of life. And basketball was basically my rest haven, my savior. So yeah. I felt the stresses of life every single day. When I went to college, I had to go back and see my son. I was getting on a Greyhound to go see my son for weekends and have to come back to school because mm. I had, you know, we get off Fridays and then we get out and go see him Saturday to come back Sunday for school Monday. Mm. Uh, I had life struggles, but again, those survival genes kicked in because basketball gave me an outlet. Because if I had all that energy and I wasn't playing basketball, what I've done? You're in a project housing, low income, survival kicks in. Most people do crime. And that wasn't been a situation, wouldn't have been my choice. And I think we have to look at now what we do as these young generations, give them a choice and give them an opportunity. So that's why I'm blessed to, to be a part of the MBPA's program for mental health with Dr. Parham and having to be a good friend with Tracy. I know if I called him, he would know what I was talking about. Yeah. It wouldn't be a like, oh man, well, I don't know what you're dealing with. Like he's dealt with the pressures of his injury and knowing his, his career could be over. Yeah. I talked to him about it and we could basically be on the same page and not have to worry about it. So connecting with people, like-minded people is all you need to do, but we got to put that in place. And I think that's what we're doing. I really like that. Tracy, as Derek's talking, you're kind of nodding your head. What are you thinking? Well, he, he just touched on the injury that I didn't talk about yet. When I was 14 <laughs> years old, I was growing too fast and my body couldn't take how fast I was growing. The structure of my body couldn't handle the growth of it. So my yeah. hip joint was growing out of the socket like that and curving just like that. Gotcha. So they had to go in and cut this part out, straighten it back up and put it back into the joint with eight screws in place and the bone had to mend back together. Mm. So with that being said, I was told before that surgery, I went to five doctors that said my career is over and I'll be lucky to even walk straight again. Man. And then that was just some of the top surgeons all over the country and didn't know that there was somebody in my own backyard mm -hmm. that, that, that can take care of me. I went to orthopedic hospital, Dr. Stanford Noel. He said, look, you know, I'll fix you up and you'll be good as new. But the whole mental trauma I went through before that with five doctors taken away, the only thing I loved in life besides my family, mm -hmm. it was traumatic. It was traumatic for a 13, 14 year old kid who was pretty good to be told, your dream is done. That's kind of a life sentence, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Holy so, God. so that was a tough mental barrel to get over. And then the recovery from that yeah. physically, DA, I tell you physically, we can work our way back, mm -hmm. but mentally, will I ever be at the level I was? Mm -hmm. And this comes back with every injury. DA's had injuries. It's like, will I ever come back? to who I was? Will I ever be as athletic as I was? Will I be able to move fluently? Will I get injured again? You know, how much will this cost me when you talk about professional basketball now? What do the GMs look at now? That's right. You know, am I damaged goods? Will they still see the same value in me? So there's a lot of this going on mentally. It's not just playing basketball. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot different. It's, it's a business. So. You're either filet mignon or you're ground beef and they put you in those categories. And that that's tough for, you know, a young ambitious player that, you know, achieve a dream and do his best and provide for his family. Yeah. I really like that. Bill, you and I talked in our first show about the adverse childhood experience. It's an assessment tool that we can use in mental health to kind of identify and kind of name things that we may not normally think of as being adverse because we're living it as kind of our normal, but these adverse childhood experiences really contribute to one's overall, you know, health, particularly mental health. And whether it's, you're talking about Derek, the idea of, you know, what you grew up in and what, what you learned to survive and how you took those moments and you chose the direction you went. Some don't. I would imagine what you're doing now, you're trying to nudge, you know, young people who are maybe in similar situations in a direction maybe that you went and coming alongside them with services and strategies to really maximize what their potential might be. Or Richard mentioning, Tracy, this idea of, 
you know, physical adversity and, and how one overcomes that very early on. That's not easy. And what we do mentally and emotionally with those things. And a lot of times we don't have a forum to talk about some of the thoughts and feelings that we have, because as men, we're not typically encouraged or incentivized to talk about shame or guilt or embarrassment or struggle. That's not part of our social DNA, is it? They look at you as being mentally weak. That's and, right. And, and, that's, and right. That's, that's the problem. That's right. I yeah. will add that I want the audience and, and you, Graham, to really hear what Dean and Tracy are saying. They were kids. That's right. Struggling with growing up issues. And they could have gone a different direction, but they didn't. Yeah. Therein lies the hidden genius that I'm talking about. That's right. Nobody really sees that. They look at the story and the drama. Both of these guys are indelibly etched with invisible tattoos of trauma. Yes. But nobody knew about it because they made a decision to go. That's brilliance. Mm -hmm. Absolute brilliance. The other thing I want you to hear is that Again, Tracy reference, you know, we go way back. Understand a 17-year-old kid, overwhelmed as he was, to even come to think about talking to someone. Yes. That just wasn't there. I mean, that's just the stigma was just very present. And, and the fact that both of these guys had life and lived experiences that would have canceled somebody else's check. Mm -hmm. They said, no, I'm going to deposit that and, and use this as the ATM card into my spirit, because I know that there's something bigger on the other end of it. And that's what I want our audience to really hear. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Most of us spend more time at work than anywhere else doing anything else. So why not spend that time in a job you love? Introducing Triad's Jobs Marketplace, the only job site dedicated specifically to behavioral and mental health professionals. Featuring more than 1,000 open jobs from dozens of behavioral and mental health employers and searchable by location, professional field, employment type, specialization, and more. Jobs Marketplace helps you find your next career opportunity. Full-time, part-time, or gig time, make the most of your time. To access Jobs Marketplace, register for your free professional account at hellotriad.com slash BHT. That's hellotriad.com slash BHT. And then click to Jobs Marketplace. If you're already a member of the Triad community, visit app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. That's app.hellotriad.com slash jobs. Visit us today and take your next career step tomorrow. Tracy, Derek, when you guys hear, and maybe even in your advocacy, when you hear this term, you know, the survival mentality, this hidden genius, how does that strike you? To me, it's very empowering, but what is your sense when you hear it presented that way from these adverse experiences and the survival that comes out of this being a genius strategy? How does that strike you both? Well, for me, it was basically, Dr. Parham said, you have a survival gene. You might not ever know what gene you have until you're put in that position. That's right. You understand? It's like nobody knows what you, that type of gene you have until it's time for it to come out. Go. Some people might not ever come out. But mm -hmm. if you have that gene and you're willing to, to see it, because we all have some kind of gene of survival. We're, that's what we're, we're, everyone's born with an innate thing of survival. But what gene do you have to persevere, to not complain, to do something? Because some people may go to jail and they'll come out better people because they've learned a trade, they've mm -hmm. learned discipline, they've learned things that they could have learned before prison. So you have things in you, but I think everyone doesn't want to tap into it. Yeah. And I think once you get a taste of it and tap into it, which we've all done as adults, we've all, you know, some parent has told us something that we completely ignored. And then the older you got, you're like, oh, that's what they did. <laughs> so I think we all have a gene. It's about tapping into it. And again, Tracy and Dr. Parham keep saying it. You didn't have anywhere to go. They would have called me weak. They said, oh, you're just another project kid. Or Tracy, you're just a prima donna. Or Dr. Parham, you're... You're just smart, so you don't know everything about everybody. They're going to make an excuse right. for something. But I think our platform is to give everyone an outlet instead of excuse. Right. And people in this world want to attack you from their own weaknesses. And I think we can never allow someone else's opinion to be our reality. Yeah, that's really true. That's really true. I think yeah. what's so incredible about Derek's situation, I mean, 
no parents, man. I had, I at least had parental support, mm -hmm. you know, to bounce things off of, and they are able to guide me into a certain situation. Mm -hmm. Dad pushing me to be stronger mentally, push through it, push through it. Derek had to try to figure it out by himself. Yeah. And, and I mean, hats off, bro. I mean, because Seriously. to, to come through, but easy. What, <laughs> hey, I'm sure when, I can't when, imagine. To come through what you come through and to be on the other side, the way you are now, bro, making it to the NBA and now giving back to young men and women, man, kudos to you, man, because it started off rough, but you look shining like a diamond now, brother. Absolutely. Hey, Derek, could I ask, when did you start? I mean, you were living this, so it's like right here and it's just your normal and somehow you're finding a way to make it through, you know, what you did early on and where you were sleeping, the jobs you had, the, the bus ride you were taking, the commitments you had, you know, when did you first start recognizing that these are some pretty impactful things that I'm finding a way to live with and excel in despite of, you know, a lot of times people think, well, it was the adversity, you know, that made them perform. No, it's not, you know, it's, it's because of the adversity that they reached this place. No, it's, it's despite the adversity, somehow people found a way, you guys found a way to overcome what the adversity was. It's despite it, not because of it per se. But when did you start talking with somebody, Derek, or, or recognizing that, hey, this is something that maybe I could get some support with and actually see what I'm doing as kind of this hidden genius. When did that start? Well, when you say what it started, when you're living in something, you don't actually pay attention no. to certain things. You, Cause I, what I did was smile to people and say, yes, sir. And yes, ma'am. They gave me jobs. They gave me help. They, they, you know, people gave me a place to stay. You know, I would work in, I, it was just very based on my attitude and my positive thought processes that changed people. Cause if I had my head down, I had negative people don't want to bother me, but I was always, Hey, how are you? Yes, ma'am. And do you gotta need help? Like I would go up and be really nice. So as I lived it, I realized if I was happy and positive, regardless of sleeping in apartment door while I'm sleeping against the door, so no drugs, people will come in and take you. You know, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think of the positive side all the time and people responded to that. Yeah, That's what we talk about in our mental health. The more positive thinking you get, the more positive can, can attract to you. Mm -hmm. But the negative side, I stayed away from it. And until I got to the NBA, when I got my first check, my first, birth certificate. Like I didn't know anything like until that 1997 time, mm -hmm. I didn't realize I needed help and I didn't have nowhere to go. Cause I hadn't gone to church. You know, I, I know I took me to church growing up. I didn't know God. I didn't know anything. So I literally was just kind of like floating until I got stable mm -hmm. in a place where I didn't have to work two jobs, go to class, take care of my son. Didn't catch a Greyhound. Like until 1997, when I got to sit down with someone who was older, who had already been through it, which turned out to be Michael Jordan. He had hired me as his first player. And he said, hey, I want you to do this, this, and that. And then I told him I want a lifelong contract. He's like, what's going on with you? I could actually tell him because he became a boss. He became a friend. So until I talked to someone who had already went through what I was about to go through, the fame, the celebrity, all that, I didn't have anybody to actually have an outlet. And only then could I even talk to other people because I felt like he wouldn't have judged me because he was a basketball player. Like if I would have met Tracy, I could have been like, Tracy, how's it feel to, you know, have both parents and then your dad pushing you hard as a mother, like right. almost making you don't want to play. <laughs> like <laughs> I could ask other players, but when you're living in it, you don't know it. But until 1997, I got to the NBA and then we had chapels in, in the NBA. Yes. And huh. When I started going to chapel and I started to connect with my, my religious and my spirituality until the NBA, I got to chapel because we didn't have it in college, you know, college, just go to class, go to practice, go hang with your, your kids, you know, the same age people. So I didn't have any leadership throughout my entire life. So from the time I was 12 to I was like 23, I was pretty much making life decisions, bad or good on my own until 97 the NBA, they gave me an outlet a platform to actually find out who I was for man. Mm. Bill, you said before, and I, I want you to, to, to quote it because I, I wouldn't do it justice, but you, you can't look at yourself until the, to, until the rivers slow down or stop. Paraphrase, but essentially there's two things that come to mind that I yeah. think are really examples of what both the entries are saying. The first is that you will never see your reflection in running water. That's right. It is only when the water is still where your reflected image begin to emerge. Yeah. More importantly and directly to the point, another mantra I shared is this. Whenever and wherever shadows have been cast, it must mean that there's light nearby. That's right. 
because you can't cast a shadow without light. And therein lies that so hope. Somewhere therein lies the light that DA and Tracy had. They may not have right. known it, but they had faith and hope there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. Gradually, they had others around them. And Tracy had his parents and others. DA had neighbors and friends. Mm -hmm. If you look at DA's shirt, AOK, -okay, acts of kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Listen to that strategy. That's what we're talking about. Here. They have the light inside. Mm -hmm. The people around them have light. They were illuminating and, and shiny brightly before they even knew it. Mm -hmm. so, so when they finally got say, oh, wait a minute, I got something here. Ooh. That star system just came up. Yeah. And a related paraphrase is that stars don't come out at night. It is the darkness that illuminates the star that is already there. Mm -hmm. So challenges are actually a hidden gift. It's a way, a different backdoor access into that genius about which we speak all the time. You know, Bill, one of the things you're talking about is in kind of these gems that you're sharing right now is the opportunity and really kind of how essential it can really be to have mirrors in our life. People and psychological, we talk about, you know, you mirror somebody, you get them some feedback, you see some things that they may not even notice, or maybe they're living that's like right here, they don't even see it. And you're able to get some perspective, they kind of go, Oh, I never saw that about myself, or I didn't realize it. This is actually what I was doing, wasn't it? There's my genius that lies therein. And you're talking about the opportunity, I would even imagine through your guys advocacy, all three of you, that you get to be these mirrors, and you get to help people discover some things they never even knew was part of who they were and part of their DNA. That's absolutely true. It, it, it is about discovery. See, my belief clinically and professionally, and DA and Tracy show this brilliantly, they don't lack anything. People feel down, get anxious, get spaced out, mm -hmm. and they feel like they lack that there's something wrong with them. Yes. We're here to say that there's nothing wrong with any of them, that the best place to hide actually is in plain sight. Yeah. These guys have to drive to say, you know something, but there's something different here. And they are also the embodiment. A lot of times people say life happens to me. Both Tracy and Diego say, damn, again, why me? But life doesn't happen to you sometimes. Life happens for you. Yeah. And when you look, really look at what these guys are doing now, it's short of phenomenal. They have shattered this. They both should have been dead or doing drugs or doing something not cool yeah these are pillars of the community and we've long since stopped talking about who we're talking about human beings it is and in the context of today's world as african-american men yeah we don't talk about that but that's sort of an understood dynamic that we just sort of embrace yeah. but that just really illuminates their genius even more yeah the crazy thing about that is Doc hit it on the head. You know, you, you do have that pressure of being African-American man. And we have the opportunity to try to not just better our lives, but better everybody's lives around us. That's an extra pressure that you're putting on yourself too. I don't know if, if DA has dealt with this. Doc mentioned, you know, the light in you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's like, sometimes your team may seem that light. They see that light and they don't like it. Like mm. DA and I, you know, we probably could have been starters, you know, our whole careers on certain teams. That wasn't our role, but we tried to be a star in our role. Yes. And sometimes that's not even liked because we're too ambitious. We're too aggressive. We see something and we go at it, but that's from our past too, mm -hmm. of everything that we had to go through, where we come from. We're still trying to move forward and push push through the glass ceiling. And that's not liked amongst the locker room sometimes. And I think the chapels is what helped me because there were sometimes I felt alone in locker rooms. But a lot of these, a lot of these cats don't understand that we all going through the same thing. And we all need some type of help to move forward, you know. And a lot of guys in the locker room don't even talk, not about stuff like this. So it's like everybody is struggling with something, but they're hiding it. Yes. At least with the chapels, I was at least 
being able, just like DA said, to, to tap into the spiritual side to where, okay, now I can go attack this differently, mm -hmm. you know, and, and not with negativity. I, I can attack it with positivity. Now, yes. not feeling like a victim, I can feel better about the situation and then attack it. Yeah. Hello, folks. Pardon the interruption, but we'll continue this discussion on our next show. This is producer Peter Finger, and on behalf of our podcast, we want to thank our guests, Dr. William Parham, Derek Anderson, and Tracy Murray for coming on to our show today. For more information about the NBPA's Mental Health and Wellness Program, please visit nbpa.com slash mental wellness. For more information about mental wellness and athletics, please visit mindhealth.nba.com. We also want to remind our listeners about the upcoming National Lifeline set to launch this July. If you're in need of someone to talk to and or in need of mental health resources, please dial 988. And lastly, we want to thank our listeners for tuning in today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.